Hello everyone. Uh, super excited to be here. A little nervous. It's my first time doing doing a video like this. I'm super excited that John's able to join. Um, just a little intro. I'm James Clancy. I'm head of developer relations at Locify, and I'm joined by John Lipsky, and I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah. So I'm John Lipsky. I'm a former colleague of Clancy's at uh, Xamarin and Microsoft. Known him for a very long time at this very point. Very long time. Yeah. In a very long time. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I'm excited to be here as well and excited to be the guinea pig. Yeah, we'll make this work. We'll make this work. So right now, I know, like you said, we've been to Microsoft together. You um, went off to GitHub and now you're off doing your own thing. Do you want to, you're running your own company right now. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I guess I've been running my own company on the side for, what are we, for 15 years now. <laughs> so what was it? 15 years ago, I was at IBM running a, an advanced analytics um, an optimization, mathematical optimization consulting practice. And Steve Jobs went up on the stage, introduced the iPad. And I said, what am I doing doing this? That's what I want to do. So quit my job at IBM and figured out, okay, what can I go and build as an app? And so started a company and built TouchDraw, which was a vector 2D drawing app from, for iOS, then for Mac, then for Android. Um, and now, also Windows, but no longer Android. Um, and so I've always had this business on the side, even though I was at Xamarin, at Microsoft, and at GitHub. And about a year ago, um, decided to to leave GitHub, um, take some time off, and so spent some time with my family, and also get to work on my side projects a little bit, or kind of scratch some of those itches that I've I've had for a while. So that's uh, what I've been doing to keep myself busy, along with a little bit of consulting here and there to to pay the bills. Oh, I understand. I'm jealous. Side projects. I can't wait to the day to where that's all I get to work on is the side projects. One day they'll all become the real project. So I'm excited. Um, I'm excited to talk, talk uh, dig in a little bit of some of the stuff you've been working on. So let's start out a little bit and let's talk a little bit about like career development, right? Because you started out, like you said, you left IBM, you went off and you built your own company, and then you ended up joining us at Xamarin. And that was pretty fun. I was actually surprised we were able to convince you to join us there. Do you want to talk a little bit about your career pro, your career path and kind of how it worked out? Did you go to school? I actually don't know that question, which is funny. <laughs> um, yes, I went, to, I, I went to college for computer engineering. Um, but no, I do not have a degree. I did not finish. Um, I liked actually coding much more than I liked uh, going to school. So um, I rather I, I decided to, to go get a job as opposed to actually finishing college. Um, that's not necessarily held me back. Um, but I'm one of those people that I knew when I was five or six years old exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, my dad bought an Apple II, and I was coding at six or seven years old in BASIC and then went from BASIC to 6502 assembly. Um, then, then we got an Apple IIgs, and I taught myself Pascal and C, and then we moved to to a Mac, where I learned to do uh, 68,000 assembly, did C and Pascal development on the Mac. Um, so I was uh, a developer even before I went to college. In many ways, it was kind of moving backwards when I started taking programming classes <laughs> in college, because I had to go from doing assembly and C stuff to doing Pascal, which was at the intro to decoding classes that, that were given when I went to school. Um, so I was already um, knew I wanted to be a developer. Um, but the thing about my career is I think I've done about every job that you could possibly do um, within within the tech, tech industry. So I was a developer. I've been a consultant, um, started a company, had it fail, um, ran um, technical sales, ran a consulting team. Um, I even for six months tried my hands at being a sales guy, completely re removed from LinkedIn. It's no, no, you know, there, there's no existence anywhere that you can finally see. But I did try to try to be a sales guy. So I think I've tried a little bit of everything, you know. And and in my roles at Microsoft and, and GitHub, they were kind of hybrid roles where I did a bit of program management, a bit of product management, and a bit of engineering management. So I've kind of kind of been in flux throughout my whole career doing a little bit of everything. No, that's exciting. Um, yeah, I, that's interesting. I knew you'd been coding forever, but I didn't realize, yeah, you went to school and dropped out on that. I went for like, like a semester or two, so I'm right there with you. 
<laughs> totally get that thing. All right. So we've got a little bit about the intro. We've done that. Let's start talking a little bit about some of the projects you're working on, because that's where we get to the exciting stuff. So I know you've been working on some interesting things. Um, I got a preview a ahead of time and saw some of the fun things. Do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about some of the stuff you've been working on? Yeah, well, I think maybe um, for much of our audience, they probably know that you worked on a library called Comet um, yes. when you were at Microsoft. Um, what a lot of people probably don't know is that Comet came out of a hackathon project that, that you and I and a few other friends of ours uh, did together. Um, and what I've been working on lately is sort of, I would maybe call it the spiritual successor to, to Comet um, or a fork of some of maybe the, um, what Comet was before you turned it into Comet back when we called it Hot UI. Yep. Um, <laughs> what a terrible name. If, if you remember that that name. Oh, yes. Um, but so, so, so what I've been working on is a, sort of an MVU or declarative uh, UI framework for C, C Sharp, um, you know, very much in the spirit of Flutter or, or Swift UI. Um, you know, and as, as I was prepping for this, trying to think back on my career, this is the fourth time I've tried to build a declarative UI framework. Um, the first time back in, I don't know, 2002, 2003, um, in Java, targeting um, AWT and, and Java Swing, um, and then made an, another pass at it, um, I think in two, 2012 or so, when I was working on uh, touch draw for Android. Um, and it kind of was, was a prototype, but didn't really go anywhere. Um, then we did, we did uh, Comet Hot UI, um, and so this is sort of my fourth attempt at it. Um, I would say both of my, also my most successful attempt at it. Well, kind of makes sense. As you progress on, you get better. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. let's jump over. Do you want to switch over? We'll switch to your screen and we can start looking at it. This is the fun part. Yes. All right. All right. See my screen? I can see it. All right. So um, before we jump into any examples, I thought it would just be better to actually show um, an example. Right. So I've got two different um, screens here. You'll see, you know, it says examples on the left and examples on the right. Yep. Um, the one on the left is running in Blazor. So that's Blazor server. Um, and the one on right is a, I, want to, I still want to call it a Xamarin iOS. It is a net, net eight iOS. So native um, iOS okay. application. So um, let's see. Um, so, you know, if we would go, you know, if I scroll through here, let's, you know, pick the, uh, let's, let's go down a little bit further, you know, stateful example, you know, let's do stateful example two, you know, the, 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 the most basic one increment, that was you know, the very first sample we built back when we, I think that was the very comment. first one we built in, um, in comment. All in right. Comment. So let's just take a step back really quick and try and update some people on what this is we're looking at, right? So the whole idea behind the declarative UI is it's a way that you're you're not using a different language between your code and your UI, and you're kind of you're building things in code, right? So we don't have two different languages that we're working with or two different files even when you're working with your UI. It's a way to do you want to zoom that in because that is really really small. Yeah. Oh, I have. Uh... <laughs> Well, I will have to turn that on because I normally I have zooming turned off because I hit it so often. Uh, does Command Plus work just to zoom in? Oh, no, that's the I one you hit. Yeah, I actually have it disabled completely. <laughs> that's hilarious. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right, so the idea is, though, you get to, like, mix and match your view model. It ditches – with MVVM, you have your, your code, your view, and your view model, and normally you do a binding, indirect type of binding to where it's normally not even type safe, but they know about each other-ish, and it's loosely coupled. Whereas doing this declarative style UI, there it it's one file. It's tightly coupled. It's – yeah, it just works. You ditch the ideas of binding and things just kind of update, which is really awesome. So yeah, you can show us through what we got here. Yeah, and and you know the I would say that you know the one difference between what we did in Comet and what we did in what I'm doing here in in what I call mix and match um, is that 
in Comet, we would you could almost do binding at um, any you know any control in the view hierarchy, mm -hmm. and it was looking and monitoring for changes, and so only it would update. You know, if, if you compare it to like Flutter and Swift UI, they're more of a you update the state and you say update, and then it goes and rebuilds the whole or updates the whole view hierarchy all at once, and that's what this is doing as well. So in this example. Um, you know, our, our sort of, you know, sample, you know, increment counter, you know, we're, we're building our view and, you know, it's, we've got a, a V stack, it's got a spacer, you know, we got labeled the text field and the text field is just pre presenting the value of state. Content view yeah. is basically a view that has a state. And so this, in this case, case the, the state is an integer. Um, and when I call, you know, increment count, it's incrementing the state. And really what's happening is it's incrementing the state and then notifying saying, okay, the state has updated at which point the whole view is reevaluated. The framework then does a diff on the tree and then renders only the, you know, the changes to the tree. Okay. That makes sense. So that was actually gonna be my next question. Cause I didn't notice the typing at first. There I was like, wait a minute, I see that build overrides and passes <laughs> an integer. How does that work? So, okay. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, like in a, you know, in a, in a typical, like, a, you know, a different type of an, uh, an example, um, a lot of times what the state may be is like your view model. So um, when I'm building more complex apps with this, um, I sort of have a view and then a view model that associates to, to that view. However, unlike when you're doing, you know, Xamarin Forms or Maui development where, you know, individual properties may be sending, you know, property notified change events. In this case, it just there's essentially one event on the whole view model, which is I've been updated. And so part of when you're developing for this is trying to decide when is a good time to go update the world. No, that looks great. That's really interesting. So did you, I'm just actually curious, did you stick with objects? Did you end up dropping it down to structs or what are we doing for the, well, obviously you're actually you're doing inheritance. So it has to, you've stuck with objects. What type of objects do we pass in for the state? It really doesn't matter, I guess, at that point. It doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. So it works with structs. And so this is, um, since I started doing this, this is the first time where um, I really found a good use for the C-sharp record types, um, mm -hmm. because you can create a new record where you're only mutating one of the, uh, you know, one of the values, one of the properties in it, and then it'll return you a new one. Um, and so it works really, really well for, for that. However, um, I don't ninety-eight percent of the time, um, what I'm passing around is an actual class, which is a you know a view model class. So I know one of the things that we did in comment, one of the reasons I didn't go with this state originally was due to garbage collection and generating a bunch of objects. How has that been for you in this library? Um, so it has not been um, an issue thus far. Um, so again, part of what you know to what, what I alluded to earlier. Um, Part of what you need to think about when you're sort of switched to this paradigm is um, designing your app. So you're thinking about what part of the view hierarchy is going to be invalidated. Um, you know, as an example, um, I will jump to my um, last. Uh, what was going to be my last demo? Um, let me go ahead and reload this. Here is an actual app that I've been um, building with it that. Um, you know, so, so um, as I mentioned earlier, as a side business, um, I have a Vector 2D drawing application. Um, and out of that Vector 2D drawing application, um, I've sort of built a, a cottage you know, group of customers that um, have asked me to build custom um, field service data collection applications. So, you know, you know, think about home appraisal or pest control companies or construction companies. Um, companies that make uh, kitchen countertops, and they all essentially have one thing in common: are you know they're going out to a you know some type of job site. They are filling out a questionnaire, answering some questions about the location. Um, they may or may not be sketching something, and then they um, also uh, you know want to generate some type of report coming out of that. And so I've, I've built enough of those apps. Um, over the years that I decided, well, what would happen if I just went and built a generic app that could be, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the new low code, no code, <clears throat> where you configure your questionnaire, you configure 
um, you know, whether or not you want to sketch something and you design your reports and it can be a little bit more automated. And so um, this app that you see here um, has been built with that. And so, you know, as I built this app, you know, part of what I'm trying to do is, you know, let's, you know, let's click into to something that's, you know, even, you know, dig down into this, um, you know, is trying to decide, okay, what are my view models in here? And when I click on something, you know, what am I invalidating? So, so the one thing that you can do, um, you know, in mix and match is, okay, when I am invalidating a, a view model or a view, it's only going to rebuild the part of the, you know, the view hierarchy that you're actually, you're actually impacting. And so for right now, if I'm clicking here on, on my tree view here on the left, um, Everything up here, nothing, nothing is changing, and it's only rebuilding parts of the view. And so, to your original question about um, trying to avoid, you know, lots and lots of object allocation, you kind of control that through the way that you build your application. And so, you're trying to, you know, send your your state change notifications only to the parts of the UI that um, uh, are applicable to the change, so that you're not rebuilding the world and you know rebuilding you know, thousands of objects every time you make an update. Um, however, in practice, um, you know, even if I would rebuild the world, I found it to be pretty performance. And because um, it, it's, it's almost like those objects are such short lived, like, you know, the .NET runtime does a great job of keeping up and, you know, they never go into long-term storage and, and they're, they're handled really well in performance, you know, doesn't seem to suffer um, so far. I cannot hear you, Clancy. I'm getting your audio though. All right, is that working? Okay, that's working. We're going to, all right, audio is fixed. I think <laughs> NVIDIA broadcast crashed on me. I had to go switch inputs. So sorry about that, everyone. That was not fun. All right. So anything specific you'd like to show us in this area, or do you want to jump into kind of like the tips and tricks and like how you build with your tools? Like what are some of your tips to be super productive as a developer and especially while building frameworks or buildings, how do you decide like what time to spend on building a framework versus just building something <laughs> existing to build an app? Cause this looks amazing and it's awesome, but it's yeah. a lot of work to build a framework. Yeah. And you know, to, to that point, um, you know, one of the things that um, you start building a, fr a framework, um, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to go and show, you know, get one control. And then it's, an, you know, another thing to then, you know, make it to be in this case, you know, what's it look like when it's enabled, when it's, when it's disabled, then it's, um, you know, how do I style it? Or, you know, how do I, how do I handle layout, you know, consistently behind all the, the platforms? Um, I would say, luckily, I like building um, developer tools and building frameworks. So um, I get probably as much joy from doing that as from actually building the end product. Um, but um, <clears throat> yeah, it's 
it's sort of a delicate balance, you know, and I, I actually have um, reminder set in my calendar every morning to, to tell me work on the app, not the framework. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but, but every once in a while, it, you know, you kind of go and have to go scratch that itch, you know, for, and I, I shared this with you a few weeks ago when I did it, um, um, you know, one of the, the itches I sort of had to scratch is within that, that app that I was building, um, I needed a calendar control. Um, and so it was a great way to go and sort of flex the, um, the capabilities of the, um, of the framework to say, okay, can I go and build a custom control that is going to work both in, in web and blazer, as you see here right now, or within, you know, iOS or Mac or, um, when you are, you know, wherever else that I wanted to run it. Um, no, and... that is beautiful. I have not built a calendar since yeah. mono touch days <laughs> and have not had the desire to do it since. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this was a, um, you know, a, a nice little side project. However, you know, that does rat hole into, into other things, um, where for example, um, I had always supported using, um, SVG as sort of my rendering for, um, graphics within, um, on the blazer side. Um, but that really got me wondering about, you know, what would happen what would the performance be if I used Canvas um, instead of uh, SVG? And so then, then I'm like, well, I need to have some way to to benchmark this, you know. So then I ended up building a little, uh, you know, harness with uh, with animation in it, so that I can kind of benchmark between, you know, what's it look like uh, between SVG and Canvas? You know, what's the the impact on performance if I, you know, start in, you know increasing the number of objects that are being rendered? Um, and so, you know, again, it's one of those things you're you're building your own framework. So it's very easy to kind of go off on a on a tangent and you know not work on the sort of the core product. Um, however, it's you know in in my mind sort of this work and doing these things is um, kind of proving to me that the framework is getting stable enough that I can actually depend on it, you know, and actually release the app that's uh, that built with it. So. Um, yeah, that's that's been really good. So you're doing all this in Blazor Server. Have you tried doing the Blazor client portion yet, or? Uh, yeah. So if we go to, of course, here. of course you have. Yeah. So the, here's that. Uh, the let's re reload it. Here's that same wow. thing, except for now because we're running in um, you know WebAssembly. Um, we have an additional option here. We can go and run it in uh, Skia. In Skia. <laughs> it looks a lot smoother actually in WebAssembly, which kind of makes sense. Um, well, it's it's funny. Um, Canvas and uh, Canvas probably performs the best. Um, I was surprised to see that the SVG render actually performs much better in um, in Blazor Server. And I'm wondering if it's the way that I actually build the SVG. I'm using the uh, you know the normal XML um, document um, model. And I'm wondering if that's generating too much um, either garbage collection or you know, too much on the, the object model. And so I think I'm going to go and write, next write just a pure you know, string writer implementation of the SVG uh, renderer. So it's so see... skipping a little bit on my screen. Is it happening on yours, or is that just the streaming? That's just the streaming. Oh, this is okay. completely smooth. Um, okay. Yeah. And you can kind of see that, you, know, the, you can watch the frames per second up there. You know, if it's pegged at around 60 frames per yeah, second, then it's that's actually smooth. Yeah. I just wanted to call that out for anyone viewing that that is, I figured it was smooth, not as jumpy as it was just showing over. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. The, the, the trick that I found with, um, you know, this is a pretty simple application. Um, if I would go and I, and I, and I have a version of, of, of this application here, um, running in blazer web assembly, um, to do, to build this, I'm referencing around, I don't know, 75, .NET projects to go Thanks. and build. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you, you know, because everything's sort of modularized between, um, you know, my, my code bases. So it's it, much of it depends on like, you know, this graphics is the stuff that's actually used in, in touch draw. Um, and so by the time it goes and, and tries to link everything and do like AOT compilation, it takes around 45 minutes to build. And so, um, 
I tend to do my development in Blazor Server and only go down to uh, WebAssembly as a, sort of a final deploy stage. Wow. Okay, so work in Blazor Server as much as possible. That's definitely a little, yeah. little hack. And, 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 <laughs> and it's also easier to, to, to debug in Blazor Server. Um, you know, having to use um, Chrome um, to, to debug with, um, and I, I'm, I'm typically in Safari, so uh, I find the development experience better in Blazor Server. So how do you handle dependencies with 75 projects? Now, is that mainly just because you're working on the framework and you like to have the framework referenced, or is this... What's going uh, on with that? Wow. Well, so, well, so, no, so I, I guess one way to um, describe also how I deploy or, and how I uh, do development is um, I've sort of flip-flopped on this over the years, but I'm currently in the phase of my development life where I'm using a monorepo. So all of the code for all of the applications that I work on, either TouchDraw or this or the, the apps that I build for customers, are all within one repo. Um, the nice thing about that is then I can go in and pull in a, a reference to a project um, on any of the solutions I'm working on, and it's you know there and built, and I can quickly uh, refactor or change something if I need to. Um, like I said, I've, I've actually flip flopped a few times, and there was a time when I had everything in its own repo, everything was um, you know its own NuGet um, package, um, and I found that I was developing slower, and so I've. Uh, kind of gone back to a monorepo and have been much happier since I've gone back to that. Uh, interesting. I don't quite do the monorepo. I tend to just check all of mine out next to each other. Yeah. So my build script is cd dot dot check out five things and then <laughs> and then it can compile. So that's like the first step is yeah, I don't I hate the way that Git works with its um Submodules. I wish submodules were nicer, but I still have most of my stuff broken out into different projects. But yeah, first first step is clone the five to 10 additional repos I need. So yeah, they're yeah, I do. I, I, I do use two. I use sub modules in, in sort of two cases. Um, so for example, mix and match is brought into this project through um, a sub module. Um, and the, the two cases that I use sub modules are either when I'm going to pull in a, an open source dependency, or when I'm doing my plan is to open source something. So, you know, the the long term goal would be to to open source um, this UI framework. So I purposely do it as, as a sub module. It's in its own repository. Um, um, the the other weird thing about my development process is my mono repo is in Azure DevOps. So I was there for the longest time. Whereas mix and match is off in in GitHub. So. I am sort of going back and forth between Azure DevOps, Git, and um, GitHub for my source code control. That's really interesting. Is there a reason you haven't migrated one way or the other? Um, mainly because um, it's, it's less to do with you know Git. I mean, I can move the repos um, you know in in twenty minutes. Um, it's because I've got all my build scripts built with Azure DevOps pipelines. They they work. They've been rock solid, and I just don't see any reason to spend the development time to go and rewrite them as, um, you know, GitHub Actions workflows. Um, yeah. And so, if I'm going to do something, you know, brand new, sure, I go and write it in, in Actions and and do it from there. But um, for legacy stuff, and even for some mobile stuff, um, I still find it's easier to do some of the mobile workflows in Azure DevOps just because the the tasks that are available to you. Um, at least the last time I tried it. You know, where there, there was more for you from a mobile developer on the Azure DevOps side than what the community was providing on the on the on the GitHub Action side. Interesting. Yeah, I've never used any of the stuff. I just have my own build scripts. Build.sh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> <laughs> super advanced like that. So, what kind of t what tools do you use to try and help manage all this? Um, your I see you're working mainly in Writer. Um, any other? tools or things yeah. that you do to help improve yeah, so, your Yeah, so um, my choice of tooling is I try to do some pick tools that is going to be consistent between Mac and and Windows. So I do 95% of my development on a Mac. However, because I have a Windows version of TouchDraw, um, I do need to do some development on Windows. And so I want tools that are going to work everywhere. So. From a you know IDE perspective, I do most of my development in um, in Writer. Um, I always have VS Code open. However, I use VS Code only as a text editor, 
um, you know, it's a, and sort of a you know, quick searching tool. Um, for example, if I if I have a solution open that's only referencing like three or four projects in my mono repo, but I want to quickly find and search something, I'll use VS Code to go search through my mono repo and find the code, you know, that I'm looking for the code snippet. Um, from a the other tool I use a lot is Tower, which is a Git client. Um, you know, I, I know that I was in you know the Azure DevOps team at Microsoft and at, at GitHub. I still can't use the Git command line tools, and so I need a GUI to do it. Um, and Towers, in my opinion, a great um, Git um, client that's available both on Mac and Windows, so I get a consistent experience um, between both of them. Um, and then the other thing on um, I, I find kind of handy, and I don't think I could live without it right now, is I use um, Pastebot on the Mac which keeps my clipboard history so that I can just cop, ah. copy something from the clipboard and I can, you know, quickly get back to it later, um, you know, in my dev sessions. So um, One that one's up. Fancy things that's on Windows just by default, if you exactly. enable it, if you if enable, enable it. it. <laughs> yeah. Was, okay. Um, question with Rider and stuff. Does Rider have, um, they added uh, Copilot support, didn't they, recently? Yeah. Do you use any yeah. of those type of tools? What AI tools do you use? Yeah, so I do use Copilot. Um, I will say I started out as a sort of a Copilot uh, skeptic because um, when I first started using it, it seemed like it was generating, and, and this was, this was when it was in the early early beta. Um, you know, I felt like what it was generating was going to have to be corrected enough. Like I could write it faster myself. However, it's definitely evolved, um, and yeah, I. I have Writer, uh, sorry, I have Copilot enabled, I'd say 95% of the time. There, there's some times where, you know, within Writer that Copilot can interfere with the completions um, within Writer, and I want the Writer completion, so, you know, I'll come down here at the bottom and, you know, disable Copilot, do some development. Um, however, what's really sort of um, impressed me with Copilot, especially, you know, building a, you know, my own UI framework, is that Copilot, you know, will look at your code base and it can build, you know, views now in, in mix and match for me um, a lot of time. And it's amazing how often it just sort of predicts exactly what I want. And it, it's it's kind of like it's 70% of the time, it's gonna give me exactly what, it, what I want and 3% of the time, it's gonna spit out garbage. And it's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want that. But um, it's, um, it's definitely on the, you know, it's worth it to, to, to use it. It's, you know, it's one of those tools now that I actually pay for because I think it's actually worth, worth using and it makes me faster. Um, as long as you, you're diligent and actually verify what it's, uh, what it's generating. Um, the other AI tool that I, I use um, is I use just uh, Bing Chat to go off and do um, image generation um, for, you know, like little, you know, say I need a, you know, a little image or something for, ooh, you know, like an error page or a 404 not found, or, you know, I want something whimsical. Um, I do image generation with, um, with that. So well, that's interesting. Yeah. I've had really good luck with Copilot. I was during all the days of working on Comet, I was always amazed when it would start auto completing for Comet. I'm like, I know it's not because it was trained on Comet repos because this yeah. is it. So super exciting seeing how well those things are working. A lot of my side dev lately has been in Godot. And Godot is cool because the editor and the game engine are the same. But yeah. I don't like that I don't get Copilot for it, which is kind of sad. Because they don't really have an autocomplete extensibility built right into Godot editor, which hopefully someone yeah. will add at some point. And the VS Code support is good, but a little wonky. So I have not yeah. been using that as well as I would like, but yeah, I miss, it's nice when you're learning a new language, especially to have Copilot because yeah, switching to Godot script has been, it's different. It's really different yeah. using a different language. So <laughs> I mess up a lot. And so it's nice having those extra autocompletes. All right. So with all this type of thing and you running your own projects and running your own business and trying to keep this whole work life balance, how do you manage all of it? What are some, some tips or tricks that you have to help manage life. In the yeah. So um, having come from GitHub and having been there, um, 
I do use GitHub projects quite a bit to you know keep track of my issues and my to-do list and my my thoughts. So um, you can you can take the person out of GitHub, but I don't know if you can take GitHub out of the person. Um, and so you know, I I still sort of adopt, even though you know right now I'm a one-person um, development team. In many of the you know ways, I'm still doing some of the same things that I would do when I was managing engineering teams at you know GitHub and Microsoft. So. Um, I, I I do individual development like an enterprise, um, and so you know I try to I try to use the tools to you know that are available to us to to keep track of things and not forget what I was working on. How and you mentioned you use like timers or things like that. How do you try and what's what's a typical day like? Like how do you try and balance between mixing between all these things? Yeah, so a typical day for me is um, you know one I. You know, wake up and check support. You know, support requests for for TouchDraw and do any um, you know answer any emails. Uh, if there are any issues that I need to resolve, I do you know sort of prioritize TouchDraw development um, above anything else, since that's sort of the you know generating the income. Then I try to focus on the the, the survey app, um, and then only go off and do framework development. Um, you know, when I, when I really need to, and so. Um, you know, I would, you know, and I would say at this point, with the exception of last week where I've been doing quite a bit of framework development, um, framework development is, you know, really less than 5% of my, my day. Um, and when it is, it's typically more of a, um, I've pushed, um, you know, I'm trying to, to build something where, you know, if I was doing the layout, for, layout on this on iOS or Mac or whatever on Windows, it works just fine. Um, however, when you're in Blazor and it's you know nested divs and inside of divs inside of divs, it doesn't quite work. Um, it's like I jump back to doing framework development to typically go and solve a web layout problem. Which layout. Aren't, it's yeah, always layout. layout and it's always, it's always layout. It's, it's always layout. I, mean, I can remember when we were building Comet or Hot UI, we felt like all we ever did was work yeah. on layout. Well, it was the same thing. Even doing Maui, we spent so layout. It's always layout. All the bugs. It's always layout. Layout engines yeah. are the devil. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy if I never write another layout engine again, but I don't see that. Even with me working on my, my game engines in Godot, I was like, oh, I might start writing a layout <laughs> engine. And yeah, there's decent layouts in there, but I still am like, oh, I'm probably going to end up doing this. I was actually talking about when we were setting up the OBS stream. I'm like, huh, I should write a layout thing for OBS. I'm like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you know, so you, you asked, you know, you know, first, you know, what was my normal day? Um, you know, I also sort of have a normal week in that um, I still do some mentoring and some advising for some of my, you know, ex-employees that work for me at um, at Xamarin, and Microsoft, and GitHub. So, um, you know, even though I'm not necessarily, you know, at a day job right now. Um, you know, I do still have some weekly one-on-ones with um, you know some of my ex-colleagues or you know ex-reports. Um, so you know, that's all. It's nice to have sort of to me at least a a break in my week that is not focused on code and on sort of more focused on the on the human side of things as well. And so I'm staying in touch and you know mentoring and you know trying to give back a little bit as well. No, that's exciting because it's got to get lonely just only working <laughs> with yourself. It's yeah always more fun when there's someone else helping on the projects so exactly yeah that's that's good um all right so what is the overall goals with mix and match because this is a really cool framework it's it's awesome um i mean it's really impressive what all you've done over the past year yeah i don't know what the the end goal is. so for, so for you know for, for me it's um one it's I mean, the immediate goal is to allow me to try to ship an app. Um, and part of the reason that um, I did this in the first place is that I had a, um, and this was about a year and a half ago, I had a Xamarin Forms app that I tried to migrate to Maui um, at the time, and I ran into um, issues, and I needed to, I needed to decide what I was going to do as sort of long term for that. Um, and so I built Mix and Match as sort of a, you know. Could I build a framework myself and you know migrate that out to that, as opposed to either going and fixing you know going um, contributing to Maui or you know keeping it on forms or 
re rewriting in Flutter, or, you know, or, you know, what are, everything else is you know, the possibilities were going to be. Um, and I found that, you know, yes, I was able to to um, build a framework. I was able to actually build and ship an app on top of it. And so, first and foremost, it's you know, allowing me to to do that. Um, long term, you know, I'd like to open source it, but I also um, I don't want um, I, 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 I say not, not that I don't want, I don't know, you know, given where I'm at, if I can afford to go and support an open source project and still, you know, do you know, work on the apps that are going to hopefully, you know, drive revenue and, and drive a business. And so that's the main reason I have an open source is because I'm afraid of supporting an open source project um, and having that be my full time job and not necessarily paying the bills. No, that's always the, the thing with open source. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, no, interesting. Um, thoughts of monetization on a framework like this, um, support packages, cause then you could potentially do something where you're doing like a hybrid open source. Yep. It is what it is. If you want support, here's the, here's the, here's the payment form. <laughs> yes, certainly something I should, I should think about. Um, but not, not yet sort of on the top of top of mind yet to really, uh, explore for, for real. Cause I, I still think, well, I've been able to use it. Um, you know, there are quite a you know, few things missing to to make it ready to put in the hands of somebody else, such as um, documentation, um, which is actually why one of these tabs um, I started to build an editor um, to go and help me do documentation because I've um, always done all my documentation for for TouchDraw um, using Markdown that eventually gets published either as PDF files. Or using Jekyll to a website, but trying to manage sort of all the metadata so that you, you get your table of contents all nice and neat is also its own problem. Um, you know, making sure that all your images are referenced, or say you want to delete a page, trying to you know go and find uh, uh, you know what are my incoming links. Well, it's not working right now, but uh, you know, incoming or outgoing links to a page, um, and so. I've started building an editor for documentation so that I can actually write documentation for mix and match. Yeah. There's some AI tools out there that can help with this as well. So maybe you could just run through AI and be like, Hey, we've got docs. <laughs> exactly. And AI never messes up. So the docs will be perfect. They'll be perfect. You're right. Have yeah. you seen the, uh, there's that one story going around about the, uh, it's on one of the sites about uh, somebody bought a cookbook that seemed to be AI generated and it just makes no sense. Oh, there's been some good ones. Oh, I haven't seen the cookbook one, but I remember what was it like a month ago when they did that with the Willy Wonka experience that was all AI generated, but it was in real life and they had actors reading AI generated scripts and yeah, yeah. scaring kids, fun stuff like <laughs> that. So yeah, no, it's interesting. AI is great as long as it's used with a discerning eye. <laughs> and <laughs> not just like, oh, AI did it. It's good to go. So it's been fun. It's been a fun, interesting journey with AI and how it's been changing and changing our industry. Yes. So along that line, if you're off doing your own thing, how much time do you get to spend on like personal growth and like learning new technologies and keeping up with all these new tools? Um, um, not, not as much as I like. Um, I mean, I, I could certainly go and do that, but then I think I spend all of my time doing that. I'm, I, I, I would say the one thing, um, at least for me, from a learning perspective, is the the way that I learn best is by doing, and so I really need a problem solve to solve to go and do it. For example, um, you know, I wanted to do you know work on some um, you know AI stuff for image manipulation, and so um, applicable to this application, um, one of the things that uh, I was playing around with. Was you know you know could I go and build something to do um, blurring of uh, oh, license, you know, license plates, plates. yeah I mean yes I I know there are services that go out in there and, and and that's a solved problem but for me it was a way to you know go and try to learn how to do it myself um, you know and try to learn the capabilities so I'm trying to sprinkle it in judiciously in a way that doesn't suck me into it where that just you know three weeks later and that's what I've been working on. 
Awesome. So yeah, there's already people in chat asking how can they follow your work because they're really interesting. So probably <laughs> following you on Twitter or things like um, that. It's best bet. Yeah, I I really should start um, tweeting and um, or, or and or on on Mastodon and posting more. I will say that um, when all of the third party Twitter clients got banned from Twitter, um, I was a uh, Tweetbot user. Um, I would say I was I was not a Twitter user. I was a Tweetbot user, and so it's taken me a long time to kind of come back to Twitter. Um, and so I need to start posting there um, again, and or to uh, somewhere. And to math. Somewhere. I'm, yeah. I'm still trying to figure out where all the developers went because all you hear is people yeah. quitting. It's it's interesting. We're in a weird transitional phase right now, and it's we so are. hard starting over. It's so hard starting over on a new platform. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so hopefully, yeah, people are interested in this. There's definitely, you're making a buzz. This mix and match is really interesting. It's really cool. Like the fact that you have this running in a website. Can we actually see um, your survey running on your iPad? You have it right there. Just curious. Uh, I, don't, I don't have it oh, running. I, okay. I don't have it uh, in, in this simulator. <laughs> yeah. okay. It's okay. Yeah. I was putting you on the spot. Yeah. Um, but, but, but the thing was, this actually started as an iPad app. And it came over to the web. So um, for me, it's more um, it's more impressive to see it running in Blazor because I've um, you know I've had TouchDraw and, and similar apps to this running in you know in iOS um, for for years. So um, seeing it over here is for me you know the the cool side. Yeah, no, that is super impressive. I know you did the initial work to get Comet running on. Um on blazer but we never really kept up with that or worked on it so it's really awesome right. seeing how well it's working because that yeah you wouldn't tell you couldn't tell it yeah it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> it looks right so that is really really impressive yes people are agreeing it looks awesome so i'm really really impressed with that all right so going forward with this what's some advice that you could give people trying to get into to working in tech or working as developers or working on cool frameworks like this, or how do people get started on stuff like this? What um, advice would you give them? My advice would be, don't worry about that technology, find something that scratches your itch and go and try to build it. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yes. I prefer .NET these days. You know, I, but I've done lots of Java development, I've done lots of C, C++, subject to C, I've done, you know, all the languages. Um, it's less about the language and more about just actually doing it. Um, and I think you can, you know, there's nothing wrong with learning along the way. I mean, I think you and I would both agree that um, we make plenty of mistakes, you know, even though we've been doing this for 20 plus years, um, you know, even we make stupid mistakes all the time and it's just about sort of, you know, getting started on it you know, have a goal in mind and iterate on that until you actually get it done. Awesome. Yeah, this is really impressive. I'm really, it's amazing you've done this in, yeah, less than a year now, I'm guessing, right? Something like that. Or has it been, yeah. or is it getting close to a year? I don't know. Uh, well, it's, um, it's, been, it's been about a year, but I essentially didn't work on it for six months. Um, you know, I had some family things going on. And so during last spring and during the summer, um, I was focused on the family, and so I didn't really do any development. In fact, if you would go look at my, you know, my GitHub profile, you know, you can see, you know, you know my commits. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, there was sort of a lull, and then things picked back up. So this was probably, you know, four to five months of development time um, over over a year. No, that's really exciting. So hopefully, in the sometime near future, it sounds like people would love to get their hands in touch on it at some point. If you can figure out a way to, to let others try it, that I think yeah. that'd be super interesting. So documentation is the next big hurdle. It sounds like. Absolutely. Yeah. They've got to know where to start samples. on am so far. <laughs> That's a full-time job <laughs> documentation. It really is AI yeah. make AI do it. Exactly. I think it's your best bet. <laughs> All right. Well, we're towards the end of the show. Any can, any final thoughts you'd like to give to anybody or how do people follow along with you? Um, Twitter, yeah. Um, yeah. Mastodon. Tw yeah. Twitter and that. yeah. Twitter and Mastodon. I'm on both of them. Um, so you can find me there. I will, I will try to be a little bit more now that the sort of the cat's out of the bag, but I have this, I'll try to be 
maybe you know, share a little bit more about what I'm doing and the progress. Um, and don't be shy about uh, pinging me. You know, if you have any questions or uh, want to ask me something, um, I like in you know engaging with the community and uh, am happy to uh, to talk to anybody. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot again for joining me, John. This was really fun looking at looking at such an awesome project, and it feels good seeing that all the work we did didn't just go away because we put a lot of time and effort into comments. So it's nice seeing something come from all from that labor of love we had there. Yes. And, and I think it proves that, you know, the idea that we had is viable. Um, that's, you know, that's the thing. Um, I'm not sure I can ever go back to, to XAML again, sort of this declarative code first UI approach is, uh, um, for me sort of, you know, all I want to do unless I'm doing, you know, really, really low, you know, low level stuff where it's like, I need to be working at the, you know, the, the native framework level. Yeah. How often do you drop down to native now that you are got your own little framework there? Is most of that, do you have very many custom renderers per se, or is almost all of it done in? No, no you know, the, the, you know, the, the interesting thing for us, for, for example, um, you know, I go, if we go to this, um, mm -hmm. this example here, um, I, I, before last week or before early this week, I didn't even have a tree view control. Um, and so I built this tree view control all with the, um, you know, inside of mix, mix and match, you know, it's complete, completely, you know, virtual, whatever. Um, however, you know, I, I went and ran this on, on Mac OS and you know, the tree view looked fine, but it wasn't, it wasn't native. And so, you know, in that case, okay, yeah, Mac OS has a, you know, a native tree view controller as, you know, NS outline view. So I went and did the, you know, the implementation, but you know, the cool thing is, you know, you can go and build a lot of custom views um, that may natively exist. And sometimes the custom one, you know, has something, something that you don't get in the native one that you're happy enough with. Um, but it's, you know, it's nice to know, you know, if you, if you want to, you can quickly go and implement, you know, a, a native render and get the, get the native control. Well, there's also the continued, or what's the right word for that? But like you mentioned, like going between Windows and Mac and things like that, and it's nice for things to feel consistent between those platforms as well. So there is, there is that. If you're having your users bounce between the web or whatever, if it looks and feels the same, it's going to be, yeah, intuitive to them. So yeah, well, and and the other thing about this is, so I've always been more of a, a a native developer. So you know, I have always preferred like my. Um, you know, my Mac apps are built on, on, you know, Cocoa, my, you know, my iOS apps, you know, use UI kits, um, my windows apps, um, you know, use WPF for have used WinForms or, you know, UWP, depending on what I've done in the past. Um, however, doing this now where I can sort of build a, um, what I think is a pretty high quality app in, in, a, in a development paradigm that I'm comfortable with. I'm almost, you know, to the point where, you know, maybe sort of the, um, you know, the, the electron Slack type, you know, apps aren't so bad. Um, and so, you know, one of the next things I want to do is sort of, you know, build sort of like the Maui, you know, Blazor native and just go and wrap this in a, you know, in a, in a web view on each native platform, because for some of the apps I built, that'd be more than enough. I don't really, doesn't care if they're, you know, truly native, because this would be good enough and I can get the look and feel and the fidelity and the experience that I want. Oh, interesting. I'm excited to see how that experiment works. So awesome. Well, again, thanks a lot for your time, John. Um, I really appreciate it. I know everyone's really excited to see this framework. So you might be getting some requests for you to open source <laughs> it from people aside from just me. But yeah, thanks again. And I look forward to talking to you again. Always fun to yeah. catch up. Yeah, thanks for letting me be first. I appreciate it. No, no, thank you for doing it first. <laughs> Who knew how this would go? But exactly. thanks, everyone. All right, talk to you guys later. Bye. All right, cheers.